Good morning. Christos Anesti. That is the greeting in the Orthodox Church uh, for a thousand years now. This is um, how God's people have greeted each other on this day. And uh, the response is, uh, Aneste Christe, Christos. It means truly he is alive. I'm going to wait just for a few seconds so people can switch from um, Brother Hunter Wilson. And uh, I appreciate Brother Honey. Uh, Honey I said Brother Honey. We call him Honey Bunny. Brother Hunter um, so much. And um, it's just... Uh, man, I love that praise and worship time together as a family. As I see my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ um, coming on here, um, I know this is um, an anomaly to be sure um, that we have to gather like this. But, you know, brothers and sisters, it's... it's, uh, it's uh, a blessing that in times like this, that we have this ability. In other words, no matter what's going on, let's look at how God has blessed us. Let's look at the reason we can celebrate today. Now, uh, for those of you that are joining us that are not used to um, Witten Baptist Church, let me explain some things to you real quick. Number one, understand that um, as I preach, um, I'm going to be talking to you about the resurrection of God. I'm not talking to you about the story of the resurrection. Um, we have taken Easter and we've made it to where we're celebrating Easter rather than celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not a story, okay? It was a historical event in the timeline of man's existence where God made the final sacrifice to reconcile a lost people back to himself. We're celebrating Jesus, not Easter. Um, Easter's not in the word of God, okay? The resurrection of Jesus is. So we are um, gonna read today uh, just two passages of scripture. Um, and you have to remember that the early church were real people, just like you and I. It's not fake. It's not, uh, uh, once again, some narrative and some novel. They were real people struggling with real issues and had a lot of the same problems and questions that we do. And uh, here in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul is writing the church of Thessalonica. It's a little small Greek city. Well, it was larger back then. Um, and uh, they were asking, you know, Paul, um, we're concerned. Um, those that have died uh, within the church, are we going to recognize them? Are we going to see them? Are we going to be able to be with our loved ones again? And uh, th these are th that was a very pertinent question. And once again, it shows the reality of the word of God that human fear um, still existed within the historical context of the church. And so Paul writes them, and he writes them a letter. Actually, he writes them two letters that we have, First and Second Thessalonians. And in chapter 4, I'm going to start uh, here in verse 13. I'm going to start in verse 13. And this is the response under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of Paul to his family. Guys, remember, we are a family. Uh, we are the family of God. And uh, we can celebrate this morning, not based upon some religious ceremony or celebrate some holiday, but we celebrate our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And this is what he would say to us today. And as I read this, listen to what it says by the revelation of the Lord. This is from Jesus Christ himself to the church. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse 13. It says this, we do not want you to be uninformed brothers concerning those who are asleep so that you will not grieve like the rest which have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, God will bring with him those who will fall asleep through Jesus. For this we say to you by a revelation from the Lord. Amen. Here we go. 
We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, he's getting off this throne to come get his people. Right now he's sitting on the throne waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. But when it comes time for him to collect his family, i.e. the church, he's getting off the throne. He's not sending angels, he's getting off the throne and coming himself. It says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, going to get the babies. He's coming to get us with the archangel's voice and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is an encouragement. It means that in this life, no matter what happens, there is a day coming when a, a, a virus will never separate us again. But more than that, more pertinent to our lives, our sin will never separate us, not just from each other, but from the Lord forever and ever more. Thanks be to God. So I'm gonna ask you to turn with me um, to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. I wanna talk to you about not the historical context of the resurrection, um, because it's, it's, it's throughout Scripture, the Gospels especially, but it's also in other historical documents. Uh, there was a Roman historian who actually wrote um, about a man named Christus who was crucified, and his followers believed that he rose again. This was a contemporary historical account and what the Roman government was trying to do with the church. If you're out there today and you have sat in church your whole life and this has become secondhand to you, in other words, the, 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 the familiarity with this narrative, the familiarity with the gospel and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you are left cold. You are left somehow unshaken, unmotivated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think it's because a lot of times we get so contemptuous about something we hear over and over again. So I'm here to tell you there is a historical truth in context of Jesus Christ living dying and rising again. But now what do we do with that? That's what I want to talk to you about today. What do we do with the resurrection? We can celebrate, amen? We can celebrate. But the word of God spends an inordinate amount of time throughout the New Testament not telling us to celebrate. It's telling us to have faith in that. And having faith in that is not a feeling. Having faith in that is demonstrable. It's actionable. So what do we do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Now, let's just read. I got three verses this morning I'm going to give you. Good, just three verses. Good morning. I'm seeing all my, I, it's, it's, for those of you that aren't members of Witten, I'm sorry. It, it, you have to, my head, I'm seeing these names and their faces are coming into my head and my heart. I want to, I want to be with my church. Um, I don't want to be sitting in my living room. I, I want to be with my church. Um, uh, yesterday, um, I was sitting outside talking to um, a couple of folks and um, my uh, church made a caravan, uh, uh, a parade you know, and they had, uh, they were all in their cars practicing social distancing, but they had little posters and banners out and they were saying hi to their pastor. And I mean to tell you, um, that, that, that'll, that, that'll fire you up a little bit. Uh, that, that'll get you excited a little bit. So, um, as I see these names, my heart, I want to be with my family. Um, but anyways, I will be. I will be again, I assure you. So just, uh, actually I lied, four verses. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm just gonna read verses uh, 55 through 58. And then we're gonna talk about it just a second, okay? All right, Paul's asking, 
Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Now the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great that brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world right now are celebrating Easter. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay. But for the Christian, it shouldn't be a one time, one day thing. Now, how do you celebrate Easter? We can wear little uh, Easter egg colors on our shirts and ties and and we can get little uh, hallelujah, praise God songs, and we can all sit in and stand in church and praise the Lord. But I tell you, the living memorial of the resurrection isn't in the songs of our voices. It's in the praise of our hearts. It's in the actions of our bodies. It's in the actions of our lives. What do we do with the resurrection every day of our life? Christianity is not a religion, okay? Being a follower of Jesus Christ is not a religion. It is a lifestyle, a changed lifestyle from where you were to where you are and praise God for where you're going. Amen? So the first thing we need to do about the resurrection is realize what the resurrection accomplished. What did it accomplish? Okay? Some people sit there and say, well, I'm forgiven and I'm going to heaven. I'm getting little angels wings. I'm getting a little halo. Listen to me, brothers and sisters in Christ. The angels will serve you. We will be joint heirs with Christ. You're not going to be an angel. Okay. You're going to be higher than the angels. The angels are there to serve the kingdom of God, of which if you are a born again believer in the son of God, you are a part of. So. It says, death, where's your victory? We need to realize what was defeated by the resurrection. The first thing that was defeated is death. Yes, death, not just death of the body, okay? Because remember, Adam was told, don't touch that. If you touch that, you will surely die. But he lived for 900 years, okay? It's not just the physical death that's overcome. It is the spiritual death that was overcome. The resurrection of Jesus Christ allowed my soul to live again. It allowed me to have communion with God again. You can't have communion with a dead person, okay? That grave is open and empty to allow us as sinful human beings to be reconciled back to God. The resurrection defeated death, but it's not just death it defeated. Yes, that second thing it defeated... As it says right here, death, where is your sting? Now, the sting of death is sin. Guys, I want you to think big picture, okay? I want you to think big picture. Some of you in your lives struggle with certain sins. We all do. I'm not going to lie. I'm a licensed, ordained preacher, and I still struggle with sin. Um, but it's not the sin that I struggle with. It is the nature of sin that has been imputed because I came from corruption. My mother and father, okay, were sinful human beings. You can't get in corruption from corruption, okay? Every human being that's ever been born, from the time they were conceived in the womb, they were going to be developed and they were going to be born in sin. God has delivered us not from the one sin. God has delivered us from the nature of sin. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all have become new. It is the curse of sin that has been defeated. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has delivered us from the condemnation of our sin nature. Now, do I still sin? Oh, yeah, but I have an advocate. 
Do I still struggle with certain things? Oh, yes, I do. I do, absolutely. But sin cannot have the last word on my eternal soul because God already has. I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, death has been defeated, but also sin has been defeated. Now, the third thing here is this. It says, now the sting of death is sin. Um... Uh, I can't read, uh, 56, verse 56. Now the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. Okay. There is a new, and I, 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 I promise you, I am not personally trying to offend anybody, okay? But inevitably, when you, um, I preach, I usually do. And, and I don't want to. But some of you folks out there want to go back and observe the Old Testament law because you think it makes you closer to God. You're trying to do that which has already been defeated. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. Ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to find holiness by trying to obey a law that was constructed by God for the very purpose of demonstrating that you cannot observe it. You cannot keep it. Some of you actually think that holiness is observing the laws of God. The law of God, as we know in Galatians, was there to show us the need of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was there to show us we need the grace of Almighty God. Going back then, as Paul said to the Galatians, you foolish Galatians, you which have been born again, you which have been made whole by the Spirit of God, are you now going to be made perfect, perfected by the law? Ladies and gentlemen, do not put that yoke of bondage on you. Do not do it because here's what's going to happen. You're always going to be less than in your mind than the resurrection of Christ has declared that you are a joint heir with Christ. You are always going to be looking at your failures rather than the freedom that is found in Jesus Christ. You're going to be trying to keep the Sabbath when you should be keeping the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. It is not the Sabbath that saves. It is not the Sabbath that glorifies the resurrection of God. It is the living testimony of God's people who have been set free from that law of sin and death. Ladies and gentlemen, why do you return to something? Why do you return to something which can never take away sins? Here, Hebrews 10, the sacrifices and the holidays can never take away the sin of the world. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. It was that propitiation on the cross. But praise God, it didn't stop with the death of Christ. We have hope today. Not just forgiveness of sins by the blood. We have a living hope today. Not in the law. Not in the celebrations. God said, I'm tired of your celebrations. I'm tired of your holidays. I'm tired of your sacrifices. I want you. And the resurrection is defeating the law, destroying the law so that God can have you, not our memorials. He wants to have us. He wants us. Guys, in a small way, it's what I started out with today. As I look at these names, Vicky and Gladys and Lee and Marty, guys, as I look at these names, Paul said this. He said, I long, my soul longs to be with you. This morning, I can honestly say my soul longs to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Not just because they're friends, but because they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. There is a bonding. There is a melding that happens when you are a born-again Christian and you are in a local fellowship of fellow believers. Your heart, if you're truly saved, you're going to love to be with your brothers. See? But now that's a human construct. Now you think about it on God's perspective. God didn't want the law. God doesn't want our holidays. God doesn't want our silly worship time. God wants his worship to come from our hearts, not from our mouths. This should be a result of what's happening in here. And if you struggle with that, 
Remember the hope in the fact that you need to realize that the resurrection defeated death, it defeated sin, and it defeated the law. Now let's go to the second thing. Not only do we need to realize what the resurrection have done has done, we need to testify, okay? We need to testify. Look at this. It says, but thanks, verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's really cool. The word thanks here is actually the Greek word charis, charis. And you know what else charis is? It is grace. But grace, grace, grace. Listen, it's a great, perfect word that was used here because we just got finished talking about the sin, the death, and the law. And now we can sit there and claim grace. We can shout the grace of God because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can celebrate and testify about how great that grace is. Oh, how my sin Oh, it's disgusting. Oh, but the grace of God has set me free. I do not feel worthy of God's love. Yeah, but the grace of God calls me to his side. I do not need or feel like I'm worthy to be a part of the family of God, but grace has already claimed me. It is the grace of God that we need to testify. The church holding up signs saying God hates fags is not the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is where we, the church should cry out grace grace to the lost and dying world our message needs to be the grace of God for it is by grace we are saved through faith and not an aisle in a Baptist church it is by the grace of God we are saved not by a sinner's prayer it is the grace of God that we are saved not by the religious uh, customs that we have we need to testify about the grace of almighty God and then it says this But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Nikos. Yes, that's where the shoe Nike gets their little name. They stole it from the Bible. Just like a lot of words in The Hobbit, Star Wars, and everything else. Plagiarism. Just kidding. Guys, Nikos. God has given us, the resurrection has given us victory. All right, now watch this. I want you to picture this. I want you to picture the Tennessee Volunteers football team. That stalwart group of young men who have been separated by God and as though they are in captivity since 1998. One day, God will send that Moses in that quarterback position to deliver them to another national championship. Well, probably not. But anyways, listen to me. God has given us victory. Think about that football game. Think about this. We're playing Alabama. We're playing Alabama. And Tennessee is on the four-yard line, their own four-yard line. And they've got to go 96 yards to win the game. There's only four seconds left. And everybody is holding their breath. The band is silent. The crowd is hushed. And someone yells, snap. And the ball is hiked. And the quarterback rolls back. And as the Alabama defenders fall on their face, as the old Miss Rebels sit there at home, because that's usually where they are. I love you, Robert. As in Georgia Bulldogs are marrying their sisters. Sorry. The quarterback throws the ball. And the Tennessee receiver runs that button hook, catches it, spins around, and runs into the goal. And he scores a touchdown. And the crowd goes wild. Woo! And then the time has elapsed. And everyone looks up to the scoreboard. And it says this. Tennessee Volunteers, one million. Alabama, zero. Christian, let me tell you something. The victory is already won. We struggle in this life. We really do. We try to do what God has called us to do. But understand this, that no matter how big your failures are, 
It doesn't matter. The game has already been won. The scoreboard is set and God's children have the victory through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. We still got to go on the field. We still have to obey God. We still have to do the work. But understand this, if we drop that ball, if we fumble, if we throw an interception, if we fail no matter what, we still win the game because Jesus rose from that grave and at that moment sin death and the law were destroyed we can give thanks because of the victory now it says this are you ready it says through the lord jesus christ ladies and gentlemen i know that there is a movement that's been happening for many years that we need to coexist. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean and I will receive you. Listen to me for a second. There are some people say there are many paths to God. Unfortunately for them, God said there's only one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me just take just a second we need to realize what the resurrection did, but we need to testify about something. As we shout amen for grace, as we look at the victory that God's already given us, we need to understand the exclusivity of which that victory comes. It is a disservice for a born-again believer in the Son of God to give instruction and to give encouragement about any other way besides the name, life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to get that victory. I would be doing you a disservice to simply sit there and say, just believe in God and you're going to get to heaven. That is not true. I'm sorry. I, I, it's not my words. It's the word of the living God. You say you believe in God. It was revealed to you by his scripture and the Holy Spirit. But understand this. You don't get to pick what you choose to believe. It says right here, the victory comes exclusively through the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the Jesus Christ little baby in the manger. Not the Jesus Christ hanging on some wooden crucifix. The Lord Jesus Christ. For you to understand the victory takes the removal of self and it takes the submission to the Lord. You can't claim baby Jesus in your heart as your Savior if you do not understand him as Lord. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. His title is earned by his blood. His deity is demonstrated by his resurrection and his coming again is proclaimed and testified by the people of Almighty God. The last thing this morning is verse 58. I want us to realize what the resurrection has defeated. I want us to testify about what the resurrection has done. But church, after this pandemic, COVID-19, whatever it is, and I don't care who you are. I don't care what local body you come to. When I say the church, I'm meaning every born again believer in the son of the living God, okay? Church, we need to capitalize on the resurrection because I believe that God, and I may be wrong, but after reading the word of God, he always rejuvenates his people. And I believe that after we get out of this, we're gonna have an opportunity to capitalize on the power of the resurrection. I really believe we are. So let's look at how we capitalize on the resurrection. First of all, understand this, verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers. You know, Paul called the Christians in Corinth, dear brothers. He called the believers in Jerusalem, brothers. He called Jews, brothers. He called Greeks, brothers. <coughs> I know, go ahead and say it. Corona. Um, he called males brothers. He called females brothers and sisters. By the word, the way the word brother is anthropoi or anthropos. It means mankind, not the gender. Okay? So you chicks are included. Somebody's got to make sandwiches. Guys, Paul said, my dear brothers, how we capitalize 
on the resurrection of Jesus Christ today. How we capitalize on that is start seeing us as brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't care what you call yourself. If you call yourself a Presbyterian, I, I, I don't care. And be, I'm a, you call yourself a Baptist, I don't care. And let me let you in on a fact, neither does God. Okay, because it says there is neither Jew nor Greek nor male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. The thing that I think we need to capitalize on in the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the church is we need to stop defining ourselves by our stupid denominations. And we need to start redefining ourselves as brothers and sisters in Christ. If we're going to be different than we were, the realization is, is the unity of the Holy Spirit of God. God does not segregate people according to uh, different colors of skin. Remember, church, there's only one race of people. One. I, I want every one of y'all on every application you put on, they ask for your race, just put human. Okay? Or more technical, put homo sapien. There's only one race of people, y'all. There's only one race. Guys, we need to see it as brothers in Christ. Now, what's that mean to be a brother in Christ? It means this. It means you are sold out to loving God, which means by default, you're sold out to loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. First John tells us, if you say you love your brother, if you say you love God, but hate your brother, guess what? The word of God calls you a liar. A liar, a liar. Usually you're the ones that are looking to the law and looking to ceremonies and looking to your culture to define truth. Let me tell you something. The word of God is a two-edged sword. Cuts through right through that bull. Right through it. You cannot hate your brother and sister in Christ and be a born-again believer in the Son of God. Capitalize on the resurrection today. Put away the stupid Easter egg baskets and start loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. And remember, love is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. Love is defined by the word sacrifice. Sacrifice your own uh, self-importance. Sacrifice your own arrogance. Sacrifice your own condemnation and come to a place where you see fellow believers as a brother or sister in Christ. The second thing we do on capitalizing on the resurrection is we are become immovable, steadfast, steadfast. You know what that means? That means I'm going that way. And you can get out the way or you can be gone over. I love this story. I don't know that my son likes it so much, but at Witten Baptist Church, we have an MMA ministry. Uh, we train fighters, and we call it fight for the mic, so that when we win the fight, we're able to take the microphone, and we're able to share the grace of God with 3,000 rednecks. <clears throat> well, one of my sons was fighting, and he got jacked. This, this other kid, uh, well, he wasn't a kid, this other young man, landed a good, solid right overhand right shot. And Josiah was out before he hit the ground. He was out. Uh, he took a nap right there. As soon as I saw that hit, I knew that Josiah was talking to the ref saying, Mommy, I don't want to go to church today because he was not home. So I started walking around the ring to get up in the cage um, to smack him around a little bit for losing, you know? Uh, no, just kidding. As I got to the door of the ring, I looked up, and the other fighter was a very um, uh, respectable young man. He wasn't gloating and being a punk. Uh, he was being a respectable young man, and the ref was looking at Josiah and making sure he was okay. Everybody takes, everybody takes a shot. It happens. But that wasn't what was amazing. Here's what was amazing. As I opened the door of the cage to walk in the ring, Josiah was wrapping his arms around the legs of the ref and trying to take him down. You know why? He was still in the fight. It didn't matter what had happened to him physically. It didn't matter what even happened to him uh, mentally. His spirit 
was immovable and he was going to decide to win that fight. Church, we want to capitalize on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to pull our shoulders back and stick our chins out a little bit. We need to quit whining about what everything is wrong and talking about how Christians in America are persecuted because we're sitting at home today and it's this great conspiracy to destroy the church. Listen to me, people. Wrap your heads around this. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can't get rid of the church. Governments have been trying to do it for millennia and every time they try to crush them, the church comes back stronger and the word of God comes back better and the church of God is refined and we become even more like Christ. You ain't whooping the church. You may knock it down, but you cannot defeat it. Why? Because it is immovable and steadfast because it is built on something other than man's religion. It's built on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. You're not going to defeat Jesus. Yeah, he took a lick. Yes, his physical body died. Absolutely. He took on the sin of the world and he was put in a hole, chained up, and it was supposed to be forgotten. Oh, but that's Sunday morning. That Sunday morning, no matter what man tried to do, that Sunday morning, that grave could not contain the glory of God Almighty. And that resurrected, glorified body of Jesus Christ, steadfast, immovable from time immortal past, where God had declared that death will not win, Jesus Christ got out of that grave. Church, get out of your pew. Get out of your smoke machines. Get out of your religious little uh, uh, scruples. Get up. Be steadfast and immovable. If you have fallen, as Proverbs says, the righteous man gets up seven times. Learning how to take a lick and keep moving forward is what the church needs to capitalize on today. It says this, steadfast and movable always excelling in the Lord's work. <clears throat> I had a man call me one time, and this is what he asked me. He said, Pastor, will you please come teach a seminar on how to revive a dying church? I told him I could, but it would be a really short seminar because it boils down to one thing, work, work, work. We need to capitalize on this, guys. We need to learn how to work again. Church, local church bodies, pastors, I'm gonna talk to you for a second. If you are open between 11 and 12 on Sunday and a 6.30 Wednesday night Bible study, you need to grow up and learn how to work a little bit, okay? Witten's open seven days a week. There's stuff going on seven days a week. Seven days a week. But I'm so tired. Pastor, come on, man, learn how to work. Guys, church, if you're, pastors, if you're not showing that work ethic, how do you sit there on Sunday morning and look at your people and tell them to go witness when you ain't witnessing? How do you tell them to share the grace of God when you're not? You sit there and entertain them with some emotional sermon. It's not, it's not when ministry happens. I know people get upset when I say this. Being a choir director doesn't make you ministry. Singing in the choir doesn't, it doesn't make you have a ministry. Getting up and preaching isn't where ministry happens. Ministry happens after that, during the week. It's not the events of grandeur and where ministry takes place. Ministry takes place in the life of individuals, disciples takes place in the life of individuals and it is work most pastors don't know how to work anymore i tell young men you want to go in the ministry learn how to be an electrician go pick up garbage for a living learn how to work one of the things i taught my children is a work ethic you're gonna learn how to work you're gonna learn how to work because church, we've been sitting in our buildings waiting for people to come in to share the gospel. Listen to me. We need to get out of that stupid building and learn how to work and capitalize on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then this, it says, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Hmm. I have to quote this to myself a lot. Uh, you know how you, 
invest your life in someone and then they just mess up and then they walk away and you're going, why bother? Why bother? Guys, what the result is has nothing to do with what obedience has declared. God said, go. He didn't tell us about the results. He said, go. And church, listen to me. I hope y'all share this because every Christian needs to hear this so we can stop saying stupid things, stop paraphrasing God's word and memorizing man's. Listen to me, listen to me. You have not led anybody to Jesus ever in your life. That's the Holy Spirit's job. You're nothing but a tool. That's all you are. You're a tool. Listen to me. Your job is not to look at the results. Your job is to know that whatever you do, it's not in vanity. It is number one. Here's why. Because God said so. God said so. God said to go. He didn't say if and or but. He said to go. Some of you people out there sit there and go, well, I don't have to go and worship in a church. I worship God at home. Crackhead, grow up. Admit to yourself, understand the conviction that's in your heart right now and understand that it is not about you worshiping God. It's about you going and working. When you go and worship on a Sunday morning, your job is to love God, but also it's to love others. How are you going to do that from the lake or sitting in your living room? Give me a break. Come on now. Grow up a little bit. Some of you are the same people who say, well, I've been a member of this church 30 years. You ain't a member of Jack. You ain't doing nothing. You're not doing nothing. Grow up. Well, Brother Jeff, I've tried. I've been hurt in church before. Oh, I was offended. Are you three? Are you three years old still? Really? You were hurt and offended? I tell you what, let's do this. I'm gonna write you I just got a special revelation from God. Okay, you ready? I'm gonna write you a sick note like your mommy used to do to get out of school. I'm gonna write you a grace note, okay? If you've been hurt, I'm gonna write you a little note that says, God, please excuse so-and-so from working for the kingdom of God because they were hurt really bad. And here's the only criteria you have to meet. Let your hurt, let your pain equal, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let it equal that. You let your life and your pain equal the Via Dolorosa. You let it equal the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You can get a free pass. By the way, it won't. Ladies and gentlemen, I know it's tiring being in the ministry. I know that you do the same thing. I think of these, this young couple at my church, um, Donna and Anna. Donna, Don, not Don, Donovan, Donovan. I'm sorry, Donnie. I, wouldn't, I call you Donnie so much, I, I said Donna. I didn't mean to do that. Um, Donovan and, and Anna, they're 20-something years old. Uh, he's an engineer. She's a nurse or a pharmacy person. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Every Wednesday night, I see little baby Anna going up and working with little girls, the uh, GAs, we call them. Um, God, that's got to get boring. Man, that's got to get tough. That has got to get monotonous. I look at Miss Carol Allred in the nursery every Sunday, and she has to beg for workers. And you know why she has to beg? Because, man, if I was in a room with three-year-olds, it'd be driving me crazy. Guess what? Do it anyways. Your labor's not in vain. Guys, Carrie Stanley, every week, without fail, scrubs our church clean. It's funny. It's amazing. We had a company that would have three or four people come into the church and clean it. And every week I was looking at our administrator going, man, this ain't cutting it. Man, it's funky. It's still funky up in here. I go in the bathroom, it smells like my son's upstairs. 
It's like a locker room up there. Please pray for my daughter. Guys, this one lady walks in and does in half the amount of time by herself what we were paying $1,000 every month to do. It's ridiculous. You know why? She's doing it because she loves her family. See, when you are following God and you love God, everything you do takes on a new perspective, a new perspective. And you don't look at the work as being vanity or something for nothing. You do it because you're following the greatest command of ever. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, on this Easter, it's great to celebrate. It really is. Uh, my granddaughter's coming over here, and we're doing the little um, plastic Easter eggs and the jelly beans and all that stuff, and, and that's going to be great. That, that's wonderful. But that has nothing to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, Just like Christmas, that has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. We're just having fun. Guys, when you realize the power of the resurrection, when you testify about the grace of God, and then you capitalize on that grace by actually working and knowing that you don't have to give up because it's not in vain, you then will truly be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I love y'all so much. And I pray today that you will celebrate by serving a risen Savior. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a good day to be alive in Jesus Christ our Lord. May the peace and grace of God, which passes all understanding, keep and guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. I'll see you uh, tomorrow night at 730, and we will again look at God's Word, and we will find more encouragement and motivation from His Word to continue to celebrate the resurrection. May God bless you.